I invite you to turn to the book of Hebrews, the first chapter. Hebrews chapter 1. Has God spoken? Does God speak? How could I know? How can I know what God says? You know, questions pertaining to whether or not God has spoken or if God has a message for man are common in virtually every society of the world, and they always have been. And of course, the answer to that question depends on how and who, how someone and who is answering the question. Because some would say, no, God has not spoken. Others would say, well, if God has spoken, we don't know what he said or what he's saying. Others would say that, well, yes, God has spoken. And some would even say, I hear his voice every day. He speaks to me. I hear him speaking. But the straightforward answer to that question, has God spoken, is yes, God has spoken. He's spoken in many ways, and he's spoken very clearly, and he's spoken very dramatically and very loudly, if you will. I mean, we go back right to the Psalms, and we read in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. God has spoken through his creation. Paul reiterates this in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Why? Because God has shown it to them. God has spoken. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. God has spoken through his creation. And God has also spoken in the hearts of men. He has spoken into their conscience. Paul continues in Romans chapter 2 and verses 14 through 16. He says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So God has spoken. He's spoken through creation. He's spoken into the conscience of the human mind. And of course, God has spoken to us in his word. And this is exactly where the writer of Hebrews begins his letter. As we mentioned last week in the introduction, the writer does not identify himself. He doesn't identify the recipients of the letter. He just jumps right into the subject matter that he's going to discuss. And the first thing he says is, God has spoken. Look at these first two verses. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So this opening statement sets the tone and introduces the main theme of the whole letter Namely, the uniqueness and the supremacy of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is the one that God has spoken through. 
And, and we see this contrast here in these first two verses. We see this contrast between the Son of God and former revelation. It's a, com- it's a comparison of the, the transitory and incomplete character of all that preceded the coming of Jesus to the earth. So let's look at this. And, and the first thing we see is, is, is what we just mentioned, that God spoke. And he spoke in the past. He says he spoke long ago, which is, which is an obvious reference to the past. But what I want us to focus on, in on here is, is this part that says that he spoke long ago at many times and in many ways. He spoke at many times. And, and the idea here, and I'm going to show this to you as we, as we look at this, this um, statement here, is that God spoke in fragmentary portions. You see, this phrase translated in the ESV at many times, uh, it could be a reference to time. It could be saying at various times God spoke. Uh, We could translate it on various occasions. But more likely it refers to many parts. The the word, the Greek word is palomeros, And you may be familiar with our English word, polymerous, which I've not used recently. But but that word means, what that word means is having or consisting of many parts. And it comes from this Greek word. You trace it back its roots, it comes comes from this Greek word. And, And so the probable meaning here of this when it's that's trans, this phrase that's translated at many times, it's one Greek word. The problem meaning is that in the past, God spoke in parts. He, he, he spoke in fragmentary portions. And, and this is what's reflected in some of the English translations, actually. In the New American Standard, it says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. The NET translates it, God after, after God spoke long ago in various portions and in various ways to the, our ancestors through the prophets. And Young's literal translation says, in many parts, in many ways, God of old having spoken to the fathers and the prophets. So I, I think that's probably the most um, legitimate and really... Um, best translation of this phrase at many times. It's, it's, he, he spoke in parts. He spoke in these fragmentary parts. They, they weren't complete. And because God spoke in fragmentary portions in the past, of course, it would be of necessity that he did that over the course of time. And really, that's exactly what we have in the Old Testament. We have a span of about a thousand years from 1500 when Moses was was writing up until about 500 when Malachi was writing about a thousand years where God was breathing out his word in fragmentary portions. He spoke to and through holy men of God from Moses to Malachi and what God wanted recorded for his people and for all to hear, he inscripturated, right? He, he had it written down, the record that he wanted us to have. He preserved it and gave it to us in what we call our Old Testament. So what we see here, first of all, is that God in the past spoke in partial, fragmentary pieces. He gave snippets of his message here and there over the course of time. And he says also that he spoke in many ways. Um, We understand that, right? You go all the way back to creation and he created Adam and Eve and and he spoke directly to Adam. He spoke to Adam and he gave him instructions on what he was to do and what he wasn't to do. After the fall, he spoke to Adam and Eve directly. You keep reading and he spoke to Cain. And then he spoke to Noah. And then 
later on we see that he, he speaks face to face with Moses on the mountain. And he's giving Moses his law and it's accompanied by thundering and lightning and the shaking of the mountain. God is speaking. God speaks to Elijah in a still, small voice. He speaks to Joshua, appearing to him as the commander of the army of the Lord. He speaks over and over again to Samuel. And he spoke to and through many prophets, some of which is recorded in the scriptures for us in the Old Testament, and some which is not. God spoke to various kings, even pagan kings, giving them revelation through dreams. He spoke through dreams. He spoke to his prophets at times through visions. You read these visions of Ezekiel. Uh, I don't know if you figured them all out. I sure haven't. I haven't even tried. I just read them and I say, whoa. He, he spoke to visions to Daniel, right? I mean, he, he revealed truth through angels. Do you remember the angel came to Daniel and said, hey, you prayed about this. Let me, let me, tell, you what's, you know, let me tell you the answer. So, so we, we look and we say, okay, we understand that. He, he spoke in many ways. God spoke. God revealed what he wanted revealed to man, and he did so in many ways. The next point that he makes here is that he spoke to our fathers, he says. God spoke to our fathers. And remember, the author is writing primarily to Jewish Christians. We established that last week. In all of this past fragmentary revelation spoken by God in many different ways over the course of time was spoken to the Jews' ancestors. The original words of God were directed to the fathers, the ancestors of these Christian Jews that the author is writing to. And he says he spoke by the prophets or in the prophets. So the prophets from Moses to Malachi record the words of God that he preserved for his people. Before God sent his son into the world, that, what the prophets spoke, what he said in the prophets, what God said in the prophets, was the authoritative record of God's revelation to man. The fragmentary portions which God spoke, were they were collected, they were authenticated, and they were put together in a body of writing called the scriptures, which consisted of the law, the prophets, and the wisdom books. Many times just referred to as the Psalms. Look with me over at Luke chapter 16. Because Jesus confirms this in this, in this well-known passage. A passage I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with in Luke chapter 16. And let's read through what Jesus says here in verses 19 through 31. He says, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus and like manner bad things but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish and besides all this between us and you a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from here to that to us and he said 
Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And note what Jesus says. He says, but Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. So, so what's Jesus saying here? He's saying, look, the, the, the Old Testament revelation, that which was fragmentary, that, that which was spoken over the course of time, that, that which was spoken by the prophets, it's sufficient. It's enough. If, if somebody won't take heed to what the revealed word of God says in the Old Testament, he wouldn't even take heed if somebody were to rise from the dead, if he were given this, this great <clears throat> sign that somebody rose from the dead and came back and said, hey, it's all true. It's all true. You better believe it. I, I was there. I, I know. I died and I'm back. Jesus said they wouldn't even believe. And of course, Jesus died and came back and they didn't believe him, did they? So, so what, what he's saying here, God has spoken in the past through the prophets, this fragmentary method means that God chose to, to bring his word over the course of a thousand years or so. And, and it's, it's sufficient. It, it, was, it was enough for the fathers, for the ancestors. So, so after stating this, the author of Hebrews then draws a sharp contrast of God's past revelation with the present revelation. And he says, God has spoken in the present. He says, in these last days, he has spoken. Okay, well, what are the last days? What are the last days? Well, look back at Acts chapter 2 with me, if you would. Because the last days begin with the coming of the Messiah. And Peter affirms this in this first Christian message preached. He affirms it by saying that what was happening in Pentecost was the last days. Acts 2, 14 through 18. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Remember, this is when the Holy Spirit came. And there were tongues as of fire on their head. And there was a great rushing of the wind. And they were, they were speaking in languages that they had never learned. Known foreign languages, and those who were in, in Jerusalem at that time for Passover, they were there, and, and they heard these languages spoken in their, you know, their own native languages, spoken by speakers who didn't know that language previously. It's, it's a miraculous thing. And so Peter lifts up his voice and addresses them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And such was the beginning of the last days. The last days have come. The last days came when Jesus came to the earth. And, and, there be, and it's being proved here that these are the last days by Joel's prophecy being fulfilled, what he said would take place in the last days. So, so God speaking in these last days is in contrast to the fact that God spoke long ago in past time. So here, here's that first point of contrast. 
Previously, God spoke. Now, God has spoken in these last days. And now he says God has spoken to us. In contrast to speaking to the fathers, he's spoken to us. The former message was given to ancient Israel in their time, but, but now in this present age, which is called the last days, God is speaking to us. He's speaking to those of us who are presently alive and here. This is what the writer is saying. And he makes another contrast. He says God has spoken in his Son. And the contrast here, of course, is in past times, God spoke in the prophets. But now in these last days, God spoken, has spoken in his son. So what I want to do for the next few minutes is I want to, I want to make sure we understand the comparison here and exactly, what, exactly why he's stating this at the beginning and as it paves the way for, for where he's going. And so I want to do a comparison between the long ago revelation in the last days revelation. And the first comparison is, is time. Long ago, referring to the past, in these last days, referring to the time when he is writing, the time that Christ usher, ushered in. So let's get just a little bit technical here to, to make sure that, that we get the full effect in the Greek language, writers placed a word or a phrase at the beginning of the sentence for emphasis. The first words of this sentence in Greek are in many parts and in many ways. So what the writer is doing is he's emphasizing the fact that God has spoken in the past in many parts and in many ways. He, he wants the readers to focus their attention on that truth. The former revelation was given during the early development and the ignorance of the world. And the present revelation comes at the end of the former days, on the very threshold of the last days, which it's ushering in. Uh, Paul, Paul explains this in, in a little different way in his sermon at Athens, right? He says in Acts 17, 30 and 31, the times of ignorance. This was the times of ignorance. These previous days, these, the, this, this old time. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now, and that's the last days now, he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. You see, the, the text here in Hebrews, in these first two verses, it, it obviously states that, that God was the one speaking, both in the former days and in the present, right? You, you see it there. Um, Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers. In these last days, he has spoken to us. So we, we understand, yeah, God spoke in both, in both eras, previously and presently. But it also indicates that the former revelation was given to lay the foundation for the revelation that was coming, the latter revelation. And we really see this more clearly in in a translation of the, a literal translation of the Greek. I think I put this on the screen. No, I didn't, but I'll read it. It says, in many parts, in many ways, God of old, having spoken to the fathers and the prophets, in these last days did speak to us. So he say, God, God spoke previously, and what that was, it was a, it was a foundation for what he was going to speak presently. The present revelation, the new revelation, is grounded in the former revelation, and it's a continuance of it. It's not different. It's a continuance of it. Because both in the old and in the new, God spoke. The new revelation in God's Son is the realization 
of all the promises, the prophecies, and the figures which form the substance of the former revelation. I hope I didn't lose anybody. <laughs> A couple people. I, I hope you can see it. That what he's saying here is that former revelation was the foundation for the present revelation in the present revelation is a continuance of the former revelation. Also, he, you, know, you look at the difference here of, of the recipients of the revelation. Okay, we understand this. This was spoken to, to the Jewish, the, the ancestors of the Jews, the fathers. The, the old revelation was. But, but, but this present revelation is spoken to us. And I want to draw your attention back to what Paul said there in Acts 17. And because what we need to know here is that this new revelation is, is not just for, he says it's to us. He's speaking of himself, the author, and those whom he's writing to. But, but it's for everyone. Look at what Paul says here. He says, the time of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands He commands whom? All people. Where? Everywhere. He commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he's fixed a day on which he's going to judge the world. The whole world. See, see this this old revelation was, was focused on the Jews. God didn't expect the Gentiles to to keep all of those Jewish dietary laws, right? No, they they weren't written for the Gentiles. But this new revelation, this revelation that comes in Christ, is for everyone, all people, everywhere, because God's going to judge the whole world by this one man that he has appointed and he has authenticated by raising him from the dead. So it's important to understand here that, that God sending his son into this world as the revelation of himself is for everyone. You see that in the Old Testament promises, right? Even you go back to Abraham. That all the earth is going to be blessed in Abraham. You, you see it as, as you trace it. You can trace it through the, through the Old Testament. And, you know, the many, many promises in the prophets, such as, especially like prophets like Isaiah and some of the Psalms, that, that God is dealing with, God's going to deal with. He's, he's going to give his revelation. He's going to offer his salvation to everyone. You come to the New Testament and you, you see the announcement of his birth. That, that this salvation is going to be to the Gentiles, a light to the Gentiles, quoting from the Old Testament. You see it also in Jesus' teaching, in his death, in his resurrection. You see it in this instruction given to his disciples before he ascended in the Great Commission. So this new revelation, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's, it's not just to the fathers, it's not just to the Jews it's, it's to the whole world. And you also see a difference in the extent of the revelation, right? Fragmentary and partial. God spoke that way in the past. But now we, we have a final and a complete revelation. One commentator writes this, he says, That which is communicated in parts, sections, fragments, must of necessity be imperfect, and so also a representation which is made in many modes cannot be other than provisional. The supreme element of unity is wanting in each case, but the revelation in Christ the Son is perfect both in substance and in form. And so you read through the book of Hebrews, and and what is the writer of Hebrews doing? Well, he's taking some of those fragments, and and he's weaving them all together, and and he's doing so to, to show that Christ, Jesus Christ, 
the, the new revelation, the Son of God, that, that He is the perfect. He is the perfect picture, the perfect display of the glory of God. You'll note that the author speaks in, in the past tense. You see that, right? He speaks in the past tense concerning both the former and the present revelation. He says God spoke in the past, and now again he has spoken in these last days. God's speaking is now complete. It's done. He, he, he has revealed what he is going to reveal. After completing his speaking through the prophets, he then spoke through his son. And God's word in Christ has, has been spoken full and finally. It's the ultimate word for us. Let me quote uh, another author as well. He says, God was speaking in former times and is speaking now in this final age. The age when the writer was writing. The former times were marked by incompleteness and anticipation. This final age is marked by complete, completeness and fulfillment. And this comparison is prominent throughout the letter as the author shows that the patriarchal expectation, prophetic words, Mosaic covenant, and Levitical priesthood have all given way to the new order of the Messiah, which unlike the old is final and permanent because its leadership, its priesthood, and its kingdom belong uniquely to him who is the eternal son. And, and that's, that's, what, that's what he's doing. He's laying, in these first two verses, he's laying the groundwork for all of this that he's going to say. We also see the contrast in the, the medium or the, the, the channel, the vehicle of revelation. He spoke in the prophets. Many ways, we, we mentioned some of them. Direct communication, face-to-face, -face, dreams, visions, angels. But now he's spoken in how many ways? One way. Now he's spoken in his son. And literally, it says he's spoken, most of the translations say um, he's spoken in his, by his son or in his son. But literally, it's, it's a son. He's spoken in a son. Or he's spoken in one who is son. So, again, a little technicality here. I'm sure I've mentioned it many times before. But the absence of the article in Greek emphasizes the nature or the quality of the noun. That's where the, the JWs go astray there in, in John 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Well, it says the word was a God. But what, what they're saying there is, it's not saying that he was just another God. It's saying that he, he was of the nature of God. He had the nature of God. He had the quality of God. And this is what, what's going on here. It's, it's the emphasis on the sunness of this one that he's revealed. See, the prophets, that, that was a group of men, right? It's, that's the emphasizing that this whole group of men that in many ways and various times God spoke through these prophets. But here the emphasis is on the Son, which draws to us the attention that this is talking about a relationship. These aren't just men that God said, okay, this is what I want you to say. That's the old revelation. That's the previous revelation. No, th this, is, this is God speaking through his son. The one who is a son. And, and the son of God is the culmination of all the prophecies and, and promises of the former revelation. Like the prophets who came before him, Jesus, the son, he spoke the word of God. But unlike them, he's the eternal word who became the word incarnate. Let, let's just go back to, to John chapter 1. Because this, this is exactly, you know, ties in with what, with what um, the author of Hebrews is saying here. John chapter 1. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word, that eternal word, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And and that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. The Word, the Word of God, the Word that was in the beginning, He was with God, He was God. That Word, that, that revelation of God, that manifestation of who God is, came and took on flesh at the Incarnation. This is, this is the new revelation. The new revelation is the person of the Son of God. So God spoke both by the prophets and, and by his Son. But Jesus' uniqueness is that he is a Son. Which is something that cannot be said of any of the prophets. So he's not only greater than the prophets... But he's also in a completely different category than them. The son is the, is the ultimate category of relationship and the ultimate medium of communication. There were many prophets, but there's only one son. And there's no comparison. That's what he's, that's what he's pointing out by, by making this comparison. He says you can't even compare them. There's no comparison. The medium of God's communication is no longer the prophets, but it's a son. It's the son of God. You know, Jesus taught this about himself, right? Over and over again. If you're still in John, look over at at chapter 5, verses 37 through 39. We could could look at a lot of different passages. We'll just look at a couple this morning. Of Jesus' own words in John 5, 37 through 39. He says, And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you. He's speaking to the unbelieving Jews. He says, For you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures... Because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying what what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Look, you've got the scriptures. You've got what was spoken by God in past days through, through the prophets. But those speak of me. And of course he said the same thing to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, right? Look over at chapter 6 here in John, verse, verses 22. Well, we're not going to read this whole passage because it's, it's lengthy, but 22 through 59 on where Jesus says he's the bread of life. But just in verse 33, he says, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. In verse 38, he says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Beginning in verse 48, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So Jesus has come. Jesus is is the revelation of God. 
Martin Luther wrote, If the word of the prophets is accepted, how much more are we to seize the gospel of Christ? Since it is not a prophet speaking to us, but the Lord of the prophets, not a servant, but a son, not an angel, but God. And further, it is not our forefathers he is addressing, but us. Quite clearly, the apostle argues in this way so that every excuse of unbelief is excluded. And that's what it comes down to. That's what it comes down to. God has spoken to us in his son. And if you're willing, if any person is willing to look at Jesus Christ and who he is as a person and the work that he has done, then, then there's absolutely no excuse. In fact, I want you to turn as we, we conclude here this morning, over to, to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And, and listen to what the writer of Hebrews says toward the end of his letter here. Hebrews 12 in, in verses 25 through 28. He says, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Speaking of Christ. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. So God spoke from the earth in the prophets. Even Moses, right? The the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. Even Moses, he went up on the mountain and and he got God's word from him. He got the law and and he communicated it to the people. but, But God was speaking to people from the earth. And he now speaks from heaven. Jesus said, I came down from heaven. Moses didn't come down from heaven. Neither did Elijah or or Isaiah. But Jesus, he came down from heaven. And when God sent Jesus, God was speaking from heaven. He was sending a message directly from heaven. Jesus said, as we read there, that the scriptures are sufficient. The rich man who had died in his sins should have believed Moses and the prophets. He didn't need a special revelation. He didn't need a miracle, such as one rising from the dead, to tell him that the scriptures were true. And neither do we. We don't need, and the world doesn't need, anything more than Jesus Christ. He is God's revelation to us. All we need is Jesus Christ and his gospel because he is sufficient. And the question really is, you know, as we as we get started in studying this book. Do you want to know God more intimately? If you want to know God more intimately, there's really only one way to do that. Get to know Jesus. Get to know Jesus. Do do you want to know how God thinks? You're probably not going to find it on many of the blogs online. You want to know how God thinks? Well, then what you need to do is you need to read, study, and understand the words of Jesus and the words of Jesus that he gave through his apostles that are recorded for us in the New Testament. 
when we fail, and we so often do, when we fail to handle the difficulties of life, we should understand, as Christians, we should understand that the primary reason we fail to handle the circumstances and the difficulties of life as we should, the primary reason we fail is because of our insufficient understanding of who Jesus Christ is. Our loving, gracious Lord wants us to grow in our knowledge and understanding of him as we pass through these trials and tribulations that come our way. And that's really why he takes us through them. So that we might know and love and trust him more and more. Remember, as we we saw a couple of weeks ago, God's primary objective in showing his love isn't to make us happy. It's to make us what? Holy. And we substantiated that from scripture. So the, the question, of course, is do you know Jesus? I mean, have you repented of your sin and put your faith in Jesus to save you, to forgive you, to, to give you eternal life? If not, he's the only one who can save you. And we encourage you this morning to turn from your sin and turn to Christ and receive him as your Savior and Lord. But what about you, Christian? Are are you relying upon the grace of Jesus in the midst of the battle as you face the difficulties and trials of life? Because he is sufficient. He, He is the absolute supreme revelation of God. And the warning there in Hebrews 12 is this. Hear him. Hear him. Trust him. Don't neglect the revelation of God who speaks to us through his son from heaven. And as you go forth today, I just encourage you as a Christian that that you would just, within your own heart, say, you know, I'm going to, I want to do this. God, help me to do this. Empower me to do this, Lord. Give me, give me, the, give me the grace to, to really seek to know Jesus for who he is and what he has done. Because that's the new revelation. That's the revelation to us in the last days. It's the Son. It's the Son. And, and, and the more you know Jesus, the better you know Jesus, the, the better you're going to respond to life's difficulties. And, and you, I mean, everyone here has lived long enough to know you can't escape the difficulties of life. And it doesn't get any easier as you get older, by the way. <laughs> so we've got a lot to look forward to and. I'm looking forward to this first chapter because he's going to go on and and tell us, right? He's going to tell us who Jesus is. He's the heir of all things. He's the creator of all things. Um, He's going to tell us all these things about who Jesus is. And then he's going to tell us how much better he is than the angels and and Moses and and on and on. And, And it's all about Jesus, the whole book. And I pray that we as a congregation would grow in our knowledge of him, which will help us to grow in our love for him and our trust in him. So may God minister the truth of his word to us. Father, thank you for your word. May it find lodging in our hearts. May we seek, Lord, to know you more intimately by knowing your son in whom you have revealed yourself to us. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.